President Kufuado makes yet another promise, this time one warehouse, one district. Government intends to construct a 1,000 metric ton capacity warehouse in each of the 216 districts. Well, experts in the agri sector are welcoming the idea of uh, planting for food and jobs, but they have strong reservations about the project. The overall objective of planting for food and jobs is to produce enough food to feed the nation. So how is the plant for food and jobs going to deal with the challenges in the agri sector it is expected to create 750,000 direct jobs specifically what kind of jobs are we talking about will farmers now make gains from their pain will there be readily available markets for these produce these are questions begging for answers we'll be delving into the matter and get responses from government and also gauge the mood of farmers and people who will be directly affected by this project. This is today's big story. My name is Aisha Ivan. The 1,000 ton capacity warehouse, according to the president, is to ensure food crops are properly stored to eliminate or cut down post-harvest losses, a major challenge to farmers. Let's listen to the president on this. Government intends to construct a 1,000 metric ton capacity warehouse in each of the 216 districts. The purpose of these warehouses will be to handle produce as well as to store the anticipated surpluses under the planting, planting for foods and jobs campaign. In the Asian experience, the existence of a relatively extensive road network that carries fertilizer and other inputs to the farms and carries farm output to the markets has set them apart from us in Ghana. Ghana government will also exp expand the feeder road and farm track networks to mitigate post-harvest losses and also ensure foodstuffs are available to customers. We're going to also listen to the Minister for Agriculture, Dr. Koto Free, who has been encouraging private organizations to go into farming in order to benefit from the project, which is expected to provide some 750,000 jobs. The overall objective of planting for food and jobs is to produce enough food to feed the nation, export the surpluses, reduce the excessive food import bill, and generate employment for our fellow citizens. A primary concern of the campaign is to create jobs for the teeming unemployed youth in agriculture and allied sectors. Both private and public institutions are being called upon and encouraged and supported to set up their own farms. Institutions like the breweries, the food processors, schools, colleges, and prisons are all being encouraged to establish their own farms. In subsequent years, the campaign will be expanded to include industrial and other cash crops and the lives of subsector. Planting for food and jobs will focus on five key crops this year. Maize, rice, soybean, sorghum, and the selected vegetables. This year, the campaign will be focused on a selected target group of up to 200,000 farmers in all 216 districts of the country.
Let's do some analysis now. And joining me in the studio is Edward Carwell, who is General Secretary of the Agri Workers Union. Deputy General Secretary. I'm the General Secretary. General Secretary of the Agri Workers Union. I got it right. Welcome uh, to today's big story. But this sounds like a massive project being embarked upon by government. What are your expectations uh, for this project? Yeah, certainly it sounds so. And then we hope that it will actually turn out to be so. All right. Um, so he, he, you just listened to the minister. He said they're going to focus on the uh, just five areas. He mentioned maize, rice, sorghum, and selected vegetables, and one other area they want to focus on. What, what are you expecting in these areas? I think that um, it's just uh, in line with what was put in the budget, because uh, in the budget we had uh, been told that uh, uh, rice production is expected to go up by 49%. Sogum by 28%, maize by 30%, and then soya bean by uh, 25%. So uh, it's exactly what they are doing. And then, of course, you need to focus when you are starting a program, and you need to uh, ensure that you achieve some successes to enable you then roll on more other areas. All right. But uh, I've heard some people, uh, even though government has earmarked 560 million cities uh, for the project, we also know that the World Bank and the Canadian and Korean governments have also pledged uh, financial support. But we've had some farmers who have complained that government did not engage in broad stakeholder consultations. Uh, do you share the same view? Well, um Sometimes we are tempted to think that money is everything. And uh, given the information that is flowing in, it means there are sufficient resources to roll out the program. That is commendable, but it does not lie in, in, in that. You need to also uh, consult the people. And if the workers, uh, particularly the farmers who are so beneficiaries, and indeed the implementers of this particular program, have some concerns that have not been given proper implementation, I mean, orientation and consultation, then of course uh, we need to address that moving forward. Otherwise, we may run into serious problems even though we have all the resources uh, to uh, roll out the program. Indeed, one other complaint that has come up is the, with the peasant farmers. Um, they're making the case that about 70% of peasant farmers uh, have been excluded from this project why uh, reason uh, being that they feel the beneficiaries i mean the target beneficiaries for this project uh, is is even wrong because it's actually targeting large-scale farmers and uh, they're also saying that we have about 80 percent of peasant farmers and if 70 percent of them are excluded that makes it a worry well it's all about how did we define the project. If the project had come to target a certain class of uh, farmers, and if they are supposed to be peasant farmers, then of course the definition of peasant farmers must be looked at. Probably, uh, even though we use one terminology, we do not actually mean that. Uh, if uh, the program had intended or had given the impression that they are targeting peasant farmers, and uh, yet uh, it now comes to the implementation and the target group is not the peasant farmers, then of course there will be a challenge. But I think that this is how we sometimes uh, come into realities with implementation of programs. Right. You know, and then we expect that they should be able to address it. You know, this is first and foremost the beginning. So if there's a challenge with the implementation uh, by the concern uh, 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 groups that you have not targeted them, then I believe that moving forward, uh, there should be uh, amendments to bring them together and to uh, capture their concerns. Because uh, we are told that subsequent uh, to this program will be uh, huge ones uh, based on the, the successes or the, uh, the experiences that we'll be getting this year. Right. So. And we have already made this point clearly, that when it comes to implementation, it's more difficult than just preparing a, a, a policy. In fact, we also made the point clearly that this country had never run short of uh, good policies. Right. But as a country, we had failed consistently. In fact, program after program, 
policy after policy to implement the policy to the letter and then to give it the needed commitment that it deserves by bringing on board uh, the necessary stakeholders and so on. Mm -hmm. So eventually, we don't get the desired results uh, that were laudable uh, looking at the policy by itself. So we need to run away from that. We cannot be trapped into uh, that type of bottlenecks and uh, challenges that we have experienced in the past. Mm -hmm. Because we are so much experienced to escape those type of uh, uh, challenges again. So it is commitment. And I think that uh, the policy implementers, and for that matter, matter, the ministry and the government, will not simply brush away uh, some of these concerns, but after this will uh, find an avenue to uh, address their concerns and then bring them on board. Do, do you sense danger with this project, especially as we find ourselves here, where uh, farmers are complaining that uh, there, were, there was no broad-based stakeholder consultation. Do, do you see that we could we could have something go wrong with this project, especially when they're also complaining that the target beneficiary may be wrong altogether? Well, when people complain, you just do not dismiss it because they are saying they have not been involved. If there's a reason why uh, many of them are not targeted, then of course it is left to the government and the ministry to be able to explain to them and see how they can uh, uh, restructure the program to bring them on board subsequently if nothing can be done for now. I mean, it's about our willingness to listen to others, our willingness to make amendments. But unfortunately, again, as a country, we uh, have had in the past <laughs> that, uh, after all, we are in charge and then uh, you dismiss complaints that are coming. You know, it does not help all of us. So there's a great opportunity hmm. in natural fact to address this challenge. And I think that there are no huge challenges. They are concerns. And when people have concerns, <laughs> you simply have to give them a hearing. You definitely and in any case, so. because this particular one they're saying, they are targeting only 200,000 farmers. Only 200, but we have more than that. In this yeah, country. we have more than that. But of course, it makes sense that you should target a number that you can manage. For now. For I now. Mean, for so certainly many people will feel not included. Rejected. Uh, not because uh, they are not good enough but that there's a limit to the number that they can contain for now. As, as so as they as can as be addressed as subsequently. Definitely. All right. So uh, the president has also been talking about increasing production as well as various benefits the project uh, is expected to bring. I think we can listen to him on that as well. The planting for food and jobs program is expected to increase the production of maize by 30%. Rice by 49%, soya bean by 25%, and sogo by 28% from current production levels. I wish to assure you that all the necessary measures have been put in place to guarantee the success of the program. To ensure that fertilizer is readily available to the farmer at affordable prices, government has reduced the prices of fertilizer by 50%. Government has employed 1,200 graduates from the five colleges of agriculture who completed between 2011 and 2015 as extension officers. In 2018, we will employ 2,000 more extension officers with a solemn pledge of employing more graduates from our colleges of agriculture in the subsequent years. All right, so the president uh, looks very passionate about this whole project, and, and that's very good for a start. But let's look at the 750,000 jobs uh, this project is supposed to create. I mean, we are told it's going to create direct jobs. Um, what kind of jobs are you expecting? Uh, we'll be getting the minister uh, on the phone to explain to us what, uh, who is going to get this kind of job, what kind of job we're talking about. But, I mean, from where you stand, what type of jobs are you expecting with the 750,000 jobs? Well, my understanding is that there are, the 750,000 jobs are going to be both direct and indirect. Okay. Yeah, because if you say the 750,000 are direct jobs, the question will be asked, 
what how many indirect jobs are going to be created mm. you know and it also helps us to uh, begin to be more statistical you know as a, a way of measuring our performances so if you say we are going to have 750,000 jobs within uh, the year now the question will be how many of them are going to be direct and even if they are direct are you talking about permanent jobs are you talking about uh, casual jobs what type of jobs do you have you know and um, for some of us, um, just about a month ago or so, you realize that uh, there was a statistical service release of the level of unemployment in this country. In the country. And it was, uh, uh, I mean, unacceptably low. <laughs> you know, we, we wondered why it should be so low when all of us are crying about unemployment. Is it about 12% or so? That tells us about how we describe people as employed. But we go beyond that. Jobs are not just for their sake. They are there to serve social and economic needs. Right. Are those jobs capable of serving those social needs? Are they capable of serving those economic needs? Are you having a job that can uh, make you earn a certain uh, standard of living in a day, uh, be able to provide three square meals? Or you're having a job that uh, you, st you struggle to even earn a, a, a meal a day? Hmm. Are you having a job that can uh, allow you to make savings to pay your rent and so on? Yeah. You know, otherwise, that is the quality of the job. And then the job security. Do you sleep and think that, oh, I will lose my job the next moment or not? Y you know, all these are jobs that address social and economic needs. Hmm. And we need to be particular, not only creating jobs, okay. but also about the type of jobs. There can be some jobs that would uh, 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 lower your dignity, right. you know, abuse your sensibilities, uh, and then undermine your whole ego and, uh, you know, suppress your uh, uh, esteem. Definitely. We don't want those, those type of jobs. We want jobs that indeed make you dignified mm. and then feel that, yes, I am working, mm. and then they are able to serve your economic needs. Right, but there's also this concern about the directive by, uh, from government that uh, farmers should pay a deposit into a bank account. Um, there are people who feel that um, this may discourage farmers in the rural areas who, for instance, may not even have the money. And again, if they had the money, they may not even have access to the bank. So this would even completely discourage such people. What do you make of uh, this directive? Well, um, the directive may be a temporary one. Uh, well, we, we've not heard from the minister yet to tell us whether it's temporary or, or permanent, uh, but generally, uh, this directive, won't it be a discouragement? Yeah, I just want to think that there's no directive that should, cannot be changed. Right. So if there are serious concerns about that directive, and if that directive is uh, having uh, some weaknesses that undermines the very survival of the program, mm. and then exclude the very target group that this program is uh, intended for, mm. certainly it requires amendments, Definitely. you know, but until you do that, you may not also actually know what will be the weaknesses of it. That is why when you draw up a policy, it may be good on paper, but it is only when you test it That's by implementation, there that you will now see the weaknesses. So we only wish that uh, the government and the ministry will pay attention to some of these uh, 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 challenges that are coming and then see how to address them. Mm. And again, I am also uh, thinking that because it is the first uh, uh, phase of it, the first year, you know, most of these things will be addressed subsequently. Uh, you know, why do they have to choose 200,000 uh, farmers for now? Right. Because you need to have a core group to implement the policy and see how it is going to fare before you now rule out uh, an overwhelming one and uh, we just that's what I'm saying that it is not out of place for people to feel excluded and expressing that right. what will be out of place is for their concerns not to be listened to okay and not to be addressed right you know address here is not necessarily satisfying them but explain to their understanding okay why at this time it is excluding ABC okay. and how they can be uh, found uh, they can be included in subsequent ones right 
or there will be an alternative for them. Mm. These are things that need to be done. I, I think that uh, we're still trying to get the Minister for Agriculture, uh, Dr. Efri Akoto. We've been trying his line. He's not picking up, but he assured us that he was going to talk to us. So when we get him on the phone, I think he, he will answer a lot of the questions that is boggling our minds. But let's also look at this. Um, Government says they're going to involve national service personnel yeah. uh, in this whole business. And the question is, what happens to the agri extension officers we already have, who have been trained already, who are there, who do not have logistics to work with, who are there and they're being paid? What happens to them if we now want to engage national service personnel? Well, um, whenever you engage a national service personnel, it is to my understanding that you do not have enough labor force to fill in. Definitely. So the national service come to serve yeah. as a supplement to that. That's handy, yeah. But uh, what we know on the ground is that there's serious labor shortage within the ministry, All particularly right. extension officers. Okay. We are also aware that uh, about the, for the next three years, 80% of extension officers will be going on retirement. Okay. So it means only 20% uh, will be available. Will be available. So even without this program, mm. it will be wise on, on any employer so to engage. begin to employ people to understudy them before the they old ones on leave retirement. or they so, go on retirement. So you think that's a good move? It's a good move to employ in more people. Uh, our statistics is that we have uh, up to or over 3,000 uh, graduates from the agri colleges right. who are looking for jobs. Mm. You know, they could be an immediate source uh, for the jobs. And that's what we are also asking. Are the jobs casual or they are permanent? Okay. You know, they are talking about we have recruited 1,200 uh, 1, extension officers. Okay. Are they on contract basis? Are they on temporary basis? Are they on casual basis? Or they are on permanent basis. But don't you feel that there will still be some uh, challenges and shortcomings, especially when we know that these people do not have logistics to work with? How, I mean, how do we make it without logistics? If we bring in thousand and one people and we don't have the logistics to work with, that will be a difficulty. Yeah, certainly we are only seeing this as solving part of the problem. But the bigger part of it is uh, putting in place the necessary uh, conditions for them to work mm -hmm. and that will include the provision of uh, logistics and then motivation okay. uh, of the staff mm. because how much I are their incomes uh, what uh, uh, st uh, logistics are available for them okay. do they have motorbikes to be able to reach them okay. you know all those things will only come after you have the personnel to be uh, on the field okay. and uh, we want to assume that this is only the first phase of it. Because you don't employ someone, come and pay the person to sit and without the necessary uh, 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 logistics. And again, there's also a labor uh, uh, politics here which you need to balance very well. Definitely. You have employed uh, 1,200. Mm. If you bring those uh, employees and you resource them very well, All right. and you leave those existing ones mm. to still be languishing in their all uh, uh, non-workable logistics, conditions. conditions, and so on, right. certainly they will not cooperate well with the new ones. Exactly. And that will bring about even conflict yes, at the, work, at the, the workplace. And, the and that will have a, a, an, an effect, effect on, this project. on the outcome. Uh, let, let's look at this uh, 1.2 billion revenue. We're told that this project, this whole project is supposed to uh, generate some 1.2 billion uh, revenues uh, for us. How does this come across to you? And is it feasible? Is this something we can achieve looking at this whole thing, how it started? Well, uh, the assumption is that once you produce, then you'll be able to sell it and then the revenue will come to you. Mm. Um, Do we have readily available markets? Um, well, if you look at, there are three major policies that are there. The one village, one dam is there, and then the one district, one factory. So the understanding is that uh, those three working together mm. will provide market for processing of the uh, produce. And because of the warehouses that the president has just indicated, yeah. it will store the uh, produce, so which will be used as the raw material for the uh, district factory. Right. But that will have 
to come later on, not within this year? Not within, because that could uh, put some challenges on, on, or that could put some burden on the government? No, it's not that. It's just that there's gestation period for uh, some of these projects to uh, go through. Okay. If it comes to building of factories, it does not take uh, it, it, the average is about two years. Definitely. But with the planting for food and job, it takes only four months. Right. All right. Many thanks for your time. Edward Karawa is General Secretary of our Great Workers Union. Uh, we apologize for not bringing the minister for a great. He actually assured us that he's not picking our calls. Uh, he could have answered some of the questions uh, bubbling our minds and looking for answers. So, but we assure you that we'll bring you updates uh, on our subsequent bulletin and we'll definitely get the minister to respond to these questions. This is today's big story. My name is Aisha Ibrahim. Have a great evening.